Hello all sentient beings and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode where we talk about all news, comics, and media related to the... On this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode, we are joined by Dr. Pants as we review Transformers War for Cybertron Siege Episodes 4 through 6. We also get a look at some new exclusive variant covers for Transformers 84 that are coming down the pipe. Today is Friday, August 7th, 2020, and this is episode 193 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast whose antivirus software saved the Alpha Trion protocols. I'm your host, Charles, a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team, Scott, the illustrious Dr. Pants. Hello, everyone. And Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Hey, how's it going? Let's talk Transformers. All right. Uh, as always, we start off the show by thanking our Donatrions, those lovely people who give us money on Patreon and PayPal. Thank you so much for contributing to the show, and we really appreciate it because it keeps us going. If you'd like to become a Donatrion, just go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support, and you will find links to sign up. Also, our seventh anniversary is coming up for the podcast just next week, August 13th. So we are taking this opportunity to update our Patreon levels and goals, and we will have more information about that next week. The new levels will not start until September 1st, so you still have a month to see what we're offering and what we're changing and to see uh, if you want to come on board. Uh, We'll also have lots of new content coming up. Uh, We've got a special early access for Donatrion's podcast with john barber and andrew griffith going through a retrospective of the 2012 robots in the skies comic series so that was really fun we've already recorded the first episode we're going to record a few more episodes maybe about one every trade paperback for the series and uh, you should listen and enjoy and though natrons of course get every episode early because uh, you guys, it pays to be a uh, supporter of the show. Well, not pays, but <laughs> you get perks. Because <laughs> y'all are the best. Exactly. You can also help out the show by buying some merchandise from our T Public store. That is at transmissionspodcast.com slash shop. You can also check out K-Girls store at tpublic.com slash user slash superstar K. We've got shirt designs, masks, other merchandise, lots of good stuff. And it really helps out the show. Buy anything from T Public through our link will help us out. We've also got the Empire of Rust episode 29 uncut version that's exclusive for Donatrions that will be out this Monday, August 10th. So you've already gotten the the regular episode came out this last Monday, so it should, you should already have access to it. That's at transmissionspodcast.com slash rust. But this episode, this is Donatrion exclusive, so you got to be in the Patreon or have access to the PayPal Dropbox that we put up all our special content. So keep an eye out for that next Monday. Uh, We've also got an interview with War for Cybertron Siege composer Alexander Bornstein that came out Monday as well. And we've also got an interview with the War for Cybertron Siege writer Brandon Easton. He wrote episodes four through six, which we are going to review in uh, this week's alt mode this week, uh, just in a few minutes. And that was great, too, hearing all the process behind creating uh, the War for Cybertron Siege story. Uh, I think that will either already be out or will be coming out very shortly when this episode goes up. So. Check our Twitter feed, check our social media feed, check our website, uh, and you'll see if the Brandon Easton interview is already up. Uh, but check, definitely check that out and check out all the other stuff Brandon Easton has been, uh, has been working on, and we'll have all the information about that. All right, now let's get into the show and start off with comics news. All right. Um, Charles, you remember last week when we talked about the changes IDW was making? New uh, president, publisher, CEO, all that stuff. Yeah, so a whole new, uh, whole new leadership team. Everything's going to be great. That leadership team's working out and, and getting things done, right? Uh, okay, so shortly after our episode aired, or actually our, after it was recorded, 
IDW Publishing placed its publisher, Judd Myers, on administrative leave five days after his promotion to the position. Uh, okay. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> wah. They didn't say why. Do we do we have the Price is but, Right losing horn sound? <laughs> I don't. I, I, wait. I need to grab that. <laughs> the new president, Jerry Bennington, will assume his responsibilities as interim publisher at this time. Uh, and like I said, they have they gave no reasons, but that's not a good look. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> From some other um, some other sites like Follow Comics News, that I was looking at there was like a lawsuit from like eight nine years ago between him and a comic shop he owned or something. I don't know. It, it was apparently settled out of court, but the speculation is that, that like kind of some allegations of the business practices and stuff mm-hmm. are, are likely what caused this. Maybe IDW didn't know, but that's all speculation that they haven't said he hasn't said, but that's the only thing people were digging up, but it, it's still, it's not a good look. You, you should vet people that you're going to be putting into positions like, you know, president, publisher, <laughs> stuff like that. That happened, like, right after we <laughs> recorded. In, in good IDW news, the Back to the Future Transformers crossover book is going to... The trade paperback is available for pre-order at Amazon. Looking forward to that. If you're one that likes to wait for the trade, pre-order it, and it'll show up. The My Little Pony and Transformers miniseries that is coming out, I believe, next week or this week? Yeah, this week. Sometime yeah. soon? <laughs> yeah, um... Before it even came out, they said that it's going to be getting a second printing. So that's really cool. They they had the the convention cover. They had a convention cover version of this book. The regular books come out this week. So kind of good. Uh, I I didn't really worry that that would ha- or that there would be an issue with that happening for this book because the My Little Pony fan base is pretty significant. Transformers fan base is significant. So there's probably a lot of a lot of interest in this book from both sides. Uh, and then uh, the Transformers 84 Secrets and Lies, uh, John Jang retailer exclusive cover for issue number two. Uh, pre-sale opens July 31st. So it, it opened July 31st for it. This one is featuring Grimlock and Soundwave, and you can get it at eastsidecomics.com. Uh, if you use discount code Grimlock, you'll get an additional 15% off your entire order. Uh, the Grimlock variant is a thousand print run limit and it costs $15 and the sound wave. It's a variant two pack, uh 500 print run and that's $45. So, Oh, the sound wave is sound wave and laser beak. Hmm. So if you were a fan of those covers, check it out. It, it's definitely, I mean, it, it's good art, but, and you know, and I think we all kind of said it didn't really fit the interiors of the book, but you know, I, I'm sure there, there are people that, just absolutely loved it. So there, this is how you can get it. I, I would imagine it would sell out. It, it, there's a lot of like on the comics collectors groups I'm, I'm in. I think there was some interest in those. As of right now, they're still available, but yeah, we, we record a few days early. So hopefully it's still available yeah. when this show goes up. If not, you should have been a donatrion and you can listen to us record live. <laughs> uh, and, and finally, we have a digital sale on Comixology for Transformers books. Uh, this is including uh, the old stuff and the new. You can get the the volume one of the new series for eight ninety nine, which is about half price. Uh, looks like most everything is about fifty percent off. If you you know if you are wanting to catch up, it's a good way to do it. And if you want to just, um, you know, get the old stuff, you know, you can save some money. So check it out. That is all we got in comics news. All right. And with that, we will move on to our review this week. And this week we are continuing our War for Cybertron Siege Netflix show review. So we are going to review episodes four through six. We reviewed episodes one through three last week. And four through six, uh, I think this is uh, everything ramps up. It's, uh, you know, it's a lot of action, a lot of a lot of things happen, a lot of plot going on, a lot of character development, too. So a uh, really exciting story. And uh, of course, we interviewed, as I mentioned earlier, we interviewed Brandon Easton, who was the writer on episodes four through six. So uh, he gave us some insight as, as to you know how he put put these episodes together. But yeah, it's. I thought it was a, 
you know, this the first three episodes were, um, you know, they were. I thought they were really good and ramped up, and I think these were these were a satisfying conclusion. These the second uh, the second set of three episodes, and there's there's not a lot of fat on these on these episodes of War for Cybertron Siege. They had they had six episodes, to, and they I think they made the most out of all the time in these in these episodes and packed a lot of character development uh, for a lot of transformers into these episodes. So I was, I was pretty pleased with the whole series. Uh, Dr. Pants, we didn't have you on earlier. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to get your thoughts overall on, on the series. So before we jump into the episode four through six review, I prepped for this. I watched this series twice, which <laughs> Knowing my previous times on the show, I have a hard time watching things, but I made sure to watch this twice. <laughs> um, I enjoyed it overall. Uh, the fact that it was only six episodes made it really, really easy to watch. I mean, I sat down and just, uh, you know, did some model building while it was on and did that twice. But uh, my overall impressions, like I said, I liked it quite a bit. Um, my big question, when is a third party company going to make a sword upgrade for that jet fire? I want the laser <laughs> sword. That's probably sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I'm a big stickler for 2D animation. I really really like that over CG, but I think the show looked really really good. A lot of the characters were a lot of fun. I thought Wheeljack was great. Mirage had an interesting kind of thing going on. I liked how they used his powers. I liked Jetfire's arc that was really good, and Alita One. She was one of my favorite characters in the show. I loved her voice acting. The, mm-hmm. the person who did her, I just, it was great. And we'll talk about it in the review more, but when Sound Blaster showed up, I loved it. <laughs> I like that there were G1 references, but they didn't beat you over the head with it like a lot of other things do, like the live action movies have done. It was more subtle G1 references kind of shoved in there. It was pretty cool. My, my two critiques, I wish the show was a bit more fun. It was really, really mm-hmm. dark and gritty, which given the circumstances of what's going on in the show, I understand, but I kind of wish there was a bit more joy, fun in it. But, you know, we'll see what happens with the next one. And I might get hate for this, but I absolutely hated Optimus Prime through the whole thing because of the guy doing his voice. Oh, okay. It, I, it, to me, it sounded like he was trying to do his best impression of Peter Cullen, but not like the old G1 Peter Cullen. It sounded like he was doing the live action movie version, which is always trying to be grandiose and trying to make everything this big epic speech. And it seemed to me he wasn't showing a lot of emotion a lot of the time with that. But the few times that he got angry and raised his voice, those times I did like it because it sounded like he was acting. All the other times it felt like he was just trying to be Peter Cullen and I didn't I didn't like it. It took me out of it a lot. I just think the he he should try and do his own take on Prime cuz me growing up I'm I'm a big Beast Wars fan and I like Gary Chalk as Optimus Primal and I like it when he does Prime mm-hmm. because he didn't try to be G1 Prime, he just tried to do his own take and I think that's mm-hmm. what people need to do and not try to just replicate Peter Cullen. As I said, overall I liked it. I just have those two critiques and the whole dark thing that's that's completely subjective same with the Prime voice but I liked it. It was fun. All right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think I, I need to say this, but I will say it with this is all going to be spoilers. This is a spoiler filled review. It's been over a week. As Dr. Pan said, this is a, this is a really short series. It's like 26, 20, 22 minute episodes. So you can watch this. It's like, it's like watching a action blockbuster movie. You can watch a two hour action blockbuster movie pretty quickly. So, if you're listening to this review, you should have already watched the series because we are going to spoil all the plot points. Uh, if you have not, turn it off. <laughs> go watch. Go watch the series. Uh, if I could then... watch it twice, anybody can get through this. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll wait. Come back when you're ready. <laughs> all right. So episode four. So. Uh, we did have a nice break at the end of episode three, where it showed like it was a it was. It showed where the status quo, where everyone was, and uh, basically they had finally broken, the Decepticons had finally broken Ultra Magnus, and he told them, okay, I'll tell you where the, the location of the Autobots base is. So we start off with episode four, 
the Decepticons uh, have their they're following Magnus and they're and he's leading them to the Autobot base and they've got all their troops ready to take them down, ready to um to finally finish off the Autobots once and for all. So Magnus leads them to Tarnhauser Gate. So this is the site of a previous a uh, long drawn out battle from the last war, not from the Autobot Decepticon War, but from the war before that, where uh, the Cybertronians gained their independence from the previous oppressive regime, uh, where Megatron, Optimus and Ultra Magnus were working together with Alpha Trion to liberate the Cybertronians. So that previous war uh, is where now there's a memorial to Alpha Trion and Megatron thinks it's it's uh, ironic that the Autobots have their their command location here uh, underneath this, uh, um, you know, this memorial to Alpha Trion and memorial to this previous battle. Uh, so, of course, Magnus leads him up and it was a trick. He did not betray the Autobots and he says he never will. And this, of course, enrages Megatron, who blows him away just right there executes him on spot fusion cannon directly to the chest Jetfire, of course is not happy about this because he doesn't think that was honorable but it doesn't matter because Jetfire is a traitor and starscream has the goods on him Jetfire has murdered skywarp and uh, so megatron of course is not happy about that and they turn on Jetfire. Jetfire fights back and then tries to escape and they shoot him down and they think he's dead he's not dead but they think he's dead uh, of course, Optimus Prime senses his friend Ultra Magnus's death, but and he knows that this means that the Alpha Trion protocols are have been released. He thinks that they will go to the Guardians because those are the those Guardians have been watching over Cybertron for eons, and he hopes that now that the Alpha Trion protocols are in their possession, they will help him stop Megatron. So Al- Optimus now has split his te- his uh, his forces into three teams where, where the Space Bridge team, led by Mirage, is going to take Ratchet, Impactor, Sideswipe, and Chromia to fix the Space Bridge. Uh, he puts Alita-1 in charge of the Ark and, has, and is having Wheeljack get the Ark ready to go. And then the AllSpark team is led by him. So uh, Optimus Prime is going to try and find the AllSpark, but they still don't know where it is. They have no idea. But first, he's going to go ask the Guardians for help. But the Guardians refuse because they are still neutral. They are not going to help Prime. The war is beneath their concern. It is just a skirmish between factions on Cybertron. It is not something that concerns the entire uh, the safety of the planet. Prime is, is dejected and leaves. But as he drives away, you can see in the distance one Guardian watching Prime leave and considering maybe maybe Prime's words touched his heart. Uh, as the energy from the Alpha Trion protocols leaves Ultra Magnus's body and races across the surface of Cybertron, they find Bumblebee and Bumblebee gets the Alpha Trion protocols. He doesn't know what they are, but they... Uh, infuse him with the knowledge of Alpha Trion. And since he, you know, he, he has this, he doesn't know who Alpha Trion was, but he knows that it's connected to Optimus Prime. So he goes back to the Autobots, tells them about what's happening to him. And Prime re- realizes that Bumblebee, the most unlikely, he's not even an Autobot himself, but he has the Alpha Trion protocols. So he encourages Bumblebee to look inside himself and Bumblebee has a little vision that allows him to commune with the ghost of Alpha Trion. So it's it's more like it, it think uh, Jarrell from the Superman movie where it's not it's not really Jarrell, but it's a computer simulation that encodes his knowledge. And this is the same thing with Alpha Trion. And Alpha Trion tells him that the reason he was he was chosen as worthy to con- to contain these the Alpha Trion protocols and knowledge of all the Autobots is because Bumblebee is pure of heart and wants peace for Cybertron. So Bumblebee comes back to his senses and he tells Prime, yes, he he met with Alpha Trion figuratively. But now the important thing is one piece of knowledge that is contained in the Alpha Trion protocols is the location of the AllSpark. And now they know where to get it. 
But before they can make plans for that, there's a, pro- a proximity alarm on the Ark. A lone Decepticon has come to their location, has found them. It's Jetfire. Damaged, wounded. He was not killed by the Seekers. He escaped. And now he is surrendering to the Autobots because he wants to join them. And that's where we end episode four. So, Jeremy, what did you think of this uh, this episode? I really enjoyed it. I thought this is where things were starting to kind of pick up a little bit. Um, at the end of three, I was wondering what Ultra Magnus's thing was because I didn't really see him as betraying the Autobots, but being tortured, you don't know. And then uh, the way that he died, I I really kind of liked how that was handled, where he knew exactly what was going to happen to him. And when he dies, you see him have a little smirk on his face where he... Like he like gave the Autobots at least that much more time mm-hmm. before Megatron found them. Yeah. So I, re- I really liked how that was handled in my notes. I wrote good guy, ultra Magnus when that I realized that he wasn't betraying him. And then immediately after I wrote dead guy, ultra Magnus <laughs> harsh, but true. <laughs> I, I kind of like the whole alpha Triumph protocol thing at first when we get into what happens to it, I have a few issues with it, but uh, I, I like in terms of, of MacGuffins that we've had in the Transformers franchise, I think this is a neat one that we haven't really explored much. And I, I liked how, I like kind of, you know, I wish it was used more, but obviously time and everything. You know, having like someone you could kind of commune with. I guess G1 kind of did that with the Matrix a little bit in season three, mm-hmm. but I, I really liked how it was done here. It was interesting. In, in kind of the mindscape that Bumblebee was in, where he was talking with Ultra Magnus. Alpha Trion, you mean? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Alpha Trion. I thought it was odd that you saw stalks of grass. <laughs> and when, when we get into some speculation, I, I, I'm wondering if that's leading somewhere. Mm-hmm. The, the jet fire thing, I think the reaction w- was understandable. I don't know. I just, I, I liked how he, he is honored, honorable. Although, um, I'm not sure why this was the final straw that he had because I, I mean it's probably clear that Megatron had done really bad things in the past. So was it just seeing someone like Ultra Magnus not giving up his his friends and family that made him kind of abandon the Decepticon cause? I don't know. Reading too much into this, but I mean overall, I think this was a, a good episode. Well, I think also he was kind of forced to ab- to abandon it because I mean he he I don't think he I don't think he was immediately going to leave after he saw Ultra Magnus get killed, but he was his hand was kind of forced when Starscream came mm. and accused him of being a traitor because he had already killed Skywarp. So right, but he was aware of the 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 genocide plan. Yeah, he does make a comment about how that's a it's a victory without honor. And Megatron kind of doesn't right. go with it. I think that's in episode three. So mm-hmm. I think seeing Megatron slip into, okay, now I am going to go with the genocide plan was more the push. Right. Mm-hmm. So that and then self-preservation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. And then the, the, the guardians bit I liked, I, I feel like the, the smoke or the mist effect could have been a little bit better. I don't know. I just, I, I like what they were going for there. I just, it, it was a little bit, confusing like when i watched it it wasn't until my second viewing that i realized that there was a guardian watching optimus prime leave and you know i completely missed that my first time so i just i i i I know the answers to most of my problems with this whole series is budgetary restrictions but in my perfect world i I wish that scene could have been visually a little bit better all right uh, dr pants what did you think of episode four I enjoyed it a lot. There was a lot going forward here and uh, a lot of action picked up. I liked, uh, as I said in my overall view, I like Jetfire's story. So, of course, we get a big turn here. I also like him being chased by the Seekers and that moment where he transforms into robot mode and jumps onto one of them and slices it up before he transforms back into jet mode. That was really cool. Yeah, that was sweet. Yeah. We get some impact or mirage story going on here, which is a nice story going forward. I kind of like their dynamic they have going on. The whole mm-hmm. idea of the Alpha Trion protocols and the Matrix and how that was split, I think was a really cool idea. It was like the idea of no one can have absolute power or control, no single one. So you always had to have 
like collaboration between two people. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. I was really disappointed. Like I liked Magnus's death. I liked the fact that he took them. He took them to the spot where he, Optimus Prime and Megatron had fought together. It was a nice kind of symbolic thing for him to do. But I was really hoping that if he died, like Megatron would blow off his head or something. And after leaving the body there, we'd see like the interior robot from the armor, like pop back out or he would come back later and actually be alive. <laughs> no, that wasn't going to happen because he, he got a hole blown out of the middle of him. But, you know, it was wishful thinking. I also <laughs> want to know, is Skywarp really dead or was Starscream lying? Because we see like Skywarp, Skywarp is really dead. Is he really dead? Yeah, that was one of the spoilers of the PR people said we couldn't talk about. Oh, well, well the, the other the other thing was Skywarp knew the location of the Autobots because that's how Jet, you know, Jetfire and Skywarp had found the Autobot headquarters and oh. Jetfire killed Skywarp to prevent him from. T- or, I mean, I, at first I didn't think Sky, he, 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 he killed, he, he just shot him, but I didn't think it was a killing blow but. he probably wasn't trying to kill him but i think yeah the damage was too severe and skywarp be skywarp stupidly did not give up the location before dying he just gave up that jet fire betrayed them <laughs> well okay so that that makes me sad but yeah. uh, my last thing i have to ask is bumblebee knows the location of the allspark because of the protocols right mm-hmm. why if magnus had the alpha trion protocols why didn't he know well, he probably did, but remember, Magnus was already gone in episode one. Like he didn't even know yeah. they were. But and I guess maybe when when he told when he sent the message to Prime about to warning him about Megatron's plan, you know, theoretically he could have sent the location of the Allspark, like just just like the Decepticons did when they sent Magnus when they sent the fake Magnus message with the location of the Allspark. But if the Decepticons intercepted his message, they would have gotten the location of the Allspark too. No, this is true. Okay, then I really don't have too many complaints. <laughs> <laughs> I just need somebody to explain it to me a little bit. <laughs> All right, Eb, Eb, we go into episode five. So the Decepticons are back at their headquarters, and they want to know what that weird signal was that got released out of Magnus's body after he died. Soundwave has analyzed it, and it's a auto. It's a secret Autobot code that is then sent through the planetary network. When it was released from Magnus's body, uh, they want to figure out, uh, you know, this code is definitely some information that is for the Autobots. So they want to destroy it and keep it out of their hands. Uh, so Shockwave has a virus he can deploy. But the catch is this virus will destroy all the Autobot infrastructure throughout the planet the Decepticons are using that too. So all the infrastructure on the planet was set up by originally by the Autobots. If they release this virus, it will cripple all the infrastructure, not just the Autobots, but also the Decepticons and anybody else who's using that. So uh, Megatron has to consider if he's going to do that. If he's willing to, he's going to cripple himself and his forces as well as the Autobots. Meanwhile, Jet the the Autobots are they know the location of the Allspark now, but it's in the Sea of Rust, which is a terrible place to get the Allspark because it's very dangerous, and they have never figured out how to map it completely and get through it. But the Seekers have, and uh, Bumblebee knows this because he used to work with a another Energon scavenger, Dreadwing, who was also a former Seeker. So they just happen to stumble upon a seeker in their custody who want, who claims to want to join the Autobots. So use they decide to use Jetfire to as a guide to help them get to the Sea of Rust and get the Allspark. Jetfire, of course, wants to help them. They still don't trust him, though. Alita 1, in particular, is not uh, happy to be tr- working with the Decepticon. And then Prowl suggests uh, they can uh, put do a core override of Jetfire. Which uh, will basically, it's like the uh, the inhibitor deterrence chip that they had in IDW, where they put a they put a chip in his head, and if Jetfire ever betrays them, they push a button and he's dead. So, Jetfire willingly agrees to do this. Prowl actually is not really happy with it. He he thought he talks about how this was a this was a shameful thing that his uh, his city state had done in the in, back in the pre war days. But he knows how to do it. So Jetfire agrees and and they think this is the safest way because he's still a Decepticon and they don't trust him. So Jetfire leads Prime, Prowl, uh, Hound and Moonracer off to 
retrieve the Allspark. They get through the dust storms and crazy stuff. Jetfire saves Prowl's life. Uh, and that further cements Prowl uh, trusting Jetfire that he's not going to betray them again and that he's really has changed his allegiance from the Decepticons. Uh, so they do make it to the Allspark. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, Bumblebee, since Bumblebee is an Energon scavenger, he can help the uh, um, Elite One and, the, and Wheeljack get Energon for the Ark. He knows a guy who has Energon, a guy named Sound Blaster. But they don't have anything to barter with, so they're going to have to steal it. And Bumblebee takes RC and Cog to steal that Energon uh, and power the Ark. So finally, Megatron decides to allow Shockwave to deploy that virus uh, because the they just can't let the Autobot code be uh, kept in enemy hands. So they release the virus, and it shuts everything down. Not just, um, you know, not not just the communications network. It also shuts down the cloaking device for the Ark and the Ark is exposed and they're dead in the water as well. This is all happening at the same time. Prime is finally prime and his team is finally getting to the location of the all spark, but it is guarded by zombies, zombots and they attack and surround our heroes uh, before they can get to the all spark. And that is where we end the episode. So, Dr. Pants, uh, what did you think? Again, I enjoyed this episode a lot. Uh, I love that in the beginning we have Shockwave being Shockwave with secret projects in the background that no one knows about that are questionable. I like when Shockwave talks about it and, you know, it could be real dicey. Soundwave is the voice of reason saying, this is going to hurt us. We shouldn't (laughs) do it. And Megatron's like, no, we're going to do it anyway. It kind of just shows that throughout the series we're getting one by one like Decepticons kind of questioning Megatron more and more as he's like delving into doing more radical things. Mm-hmm. So I like that, especially given Soundwave's history of being very, very loyal. Uh, when Bumblebee is talking about the Sea of Rust and everything, he name drops Dreadwind, which I thought was kind of cool. That was a bot I didn't expect to get brought up. Mm-hmm. I like the team of Bumblebee, RC, and Cog going in. Because uh, I'm sure you guys talked about before, but Cog actually turning into a weaponizer rather than a vehicle was really, really cool. Just becoming the shoulder cannons. Yeah. I really liked when he did that. And it was nice to see RC. Uh, I thought she she was done very well and it was a lot of fun to see them together. And l- with that, I liked how they did Sound Blaster. I mentioned that before. And I liked his voice. He, I thought they did a really cool kind of synthesized voice for him that was way better than Soundwave's synthesized voice. And also, he had the he had the Merc faction yeah. logo, which was cool mm-hmm. to see in the show. I'm hoping we see more of those. The whole All Spark thing was a lot of fun. I like seeing that team go out. I will say uh, one thing: it, Moonracer had a recent toy, like well, somewhat recent. Could we have given her a different head than Chromius? <laughs> yeah, character. That's another <laughs> character model, Scott. Come on. <laughs> well, it's, it, well, she had the same body as Chromia. You could have just given her a different head. They did the same thing for a. Uh, uh, Red Alert and Sideswipe, they had two different heads in the series. Oh. I mean, it was really, really mild, but... And one other dumb thing that I really loved, uh, when they first show the Sea of Rust, there's, like, a laser beak type robot munching on, like, a carcass, and I just yeah. thought that was kind of cool, and I added to the environment. I like that little touch. That was fun. Mm-hmm. Yep. Jeremy, what did you think? Uh, I enjoyed this episode, too. I also thought that Soundwave being the voice of reason was just a nice touch. From what I understand with how they explained the like the infrastructure stuff, it was just it was made when they were all kind of one race or one, you know, just before the Autobot Decepticon war. Mm-hmm. So it would make sense that there's a common infrastructure. Right. This is kind of really where Megatron turns fully to the dark. Like he, he was he was honorable in his actions really up until this point. Just, Except for the whole torturing Ultra Magnus, thing. <laughs> um, but this is when he made the decision to do the virus. That's when he just went full, you know, win at all costs. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed the whole um, the core override chip for Jetfire, and you know, I, I thought that was a nice nod back to the uh, the ID chips. The sound blaster scene was just great all around. I, I love that they they scanned for weapons and Cog didn't rec- register as a weapon. <laughs> you know that. I, I guess, I mean, they were searching for, like, hand weapons and stuff, yeah. but 
It's like Cog's secret superpower. They should t- they should tell him, okay, we're going to scan you for weapons, and I want you to transform. <laughs> right. The the Sea of Rust just looked nasty to me. It it just, I mean, in a good way. It just it it did not look like a a fun place to be. And you know, we we had recently gotten it in the comics, like recently being a few years ago, but. I, I loved seeing how it was portrayed here. I do think the the zombie bots were kind of a uh, I don't know. It, it seemed a little bit out of place, just kind of because we hadn't seen the concept before this episode. But for just getting to the all spark, I mean, it, it worked. I, I didn't see why Moonracer had to die, but you know, it is what it is. Um, she was basically the red shirt on that team. <laughs> yeah, rip her to pieces. I felt the the panic when they were getting the reports about the bases going down everywhere. I thought that was really done well. Like you, there was really kind of a a sense of urgency that came across, especially when like Cliff Jumper came on and then he was you know disconnected. I, I don't know why when they were getting these in, they didn't disconnect the arc from the planet's infrastructure. Yeah, that might not have, have solved the problem, but it just it would seem like. When something like a virus is going around, the first thing you do is try to isolate yourself. But, Social um, distancing. Yeah. See, I think that was about it. And then yeah, everything else I was going to talk about is in the next issue. So, um, well, I, I do I do like the um, – when Bumblebee mentions that like, like he knows where to get the Energon stuff, I love that they didn't, they didn't use the Alpha Trion protocols as how he knew where to go. You know, it was kind of a, a swerve and, you know, he like learned it from Dreadwing, you know, because having just gotten the Alpha Trion protocols, you would assume like in a lot of shows they would use that for everything. So I like it. This is just from his own experience. He knows a guy who knows a guy. And I like that. So um, I think that is all the comments I had on this one. It was a good episode. Yeah. Yeah. Bumblebee uh, was it's a very unique take on Bumblebee. Like he's very much. uh a character who has a little, he's he's has an edge because he's been surviving on his own for so long and he's you know right but but he's not jaded mm-hmm. i mean he kind of came across that in the earlier episodes but there's still kind of that wanting to look on the positive side of bumblebee that's kind of coming through a little bit mm-hmm. yeah one thing i will say for i mean i was i was happy to see rc as a as a character here and and getting a little bit of screen time but i will say i mean it was clear that her model her character model did not have the toy design available yet when they when they did that cuz her design just mm-hmm. is very it's it's very distinct from all the other character model designs and it it kind of almost doesn't yeah. fit with the other characters I mean, kind of like Alita a little bit the same way. Yeah. But we never see alt modes for either of them. Yeah. But uh, but I was still happy to see her in the show and getting and, uh, you know, just popping up as a as just a, another another random Autobot the uh, getting to do stuff. So that was nice. All right. The epic conclusion, episode six. So this is everything hits the fan in this episode. So. Bumblebee, RC, and Cog had been caught by Sound Blaster at the, uh, they, you know, they were trying to escape with the Energon. Uh, and Sound Blaster is like, yeah, you know, I, I knew you guys were, you know, were going to, uh, were going to try to double cross me because I, I knew Megatron was looking for these Autobots and the Autobot, uh, captured Autobots are worth a lot more than the Energon you were, you were turning in. So he's not, you know, he's not in the mood to make a deal there and, but uh, just as luck would have it, uh, just as they are about to be captured, the virus hits Sound Blaster's base and shuts everything down. So that Decepticon virus, uh, you know, does it, it does harm, but it also does good for our heroes in this situation. And RC, Bumblebee and Cog use the confusion and the chaos to escape. They shoot their way out. With Cog as uh, you know the the giant guns on RC's shoulders, they make it to a little land transport. They've got the Energon. They load it up and they drive off. But just before they can drive off, Bumblebee just suddenly shuts down. He's like, it's like someone hit the off switch. He's just completely unconscious. And they're like, what happened? What happened to Bumblebee? Um, 
so RC shoves him out of the out of the way out of the driver's seat so she can drive the the transport and get out of there and they escape so they make it back to the ark with the energon uh but uh, they can't. They, you know, they get there, and Bumblebee's still unconscious. They're like, "What? What happened to him?" And they're not sure. Uh, meanwhile, back in the Sea of Rust, uh, we already talked about how Moon Racer was basically torn apart by the zombies. Uh, the other bots are surrounded. They're getting. You know, they're they're the zombies keep attacking. They they don't know what they are. And and Prowl says there's a legend that dead dead uh, bots gather near the all spark hoping to be revived and brought back to life so that's what these zombies are so they're kind of like the protection uh, they protect the all spark from uh other people but they also are are looking to be revived by it so uh they the autobots distract them enough to give optimus prime a chance to drive and reach out to the all spark he drives up launches himself in the air and grabs the all spark and once he touches it uh it responds to his uh his um you know i guess since he's a prime he you know is the chosen one and all that stuff so he grabs the all spark the all spark uh destroys all of the zombies they all turn to dust and the all spark uh is glowing and then re- returns back to its little encasement and they they are able to carry it with them. So everyone minus uh, moon racer goes back and they, they call the arc. They try to contact the arc, but there's no answer. So they're driving back out of the sea of rust. Uh, meanwhile, the Decepticons have mobilized all their forces and they converge on the arc. They are now Megatron is really, he's ready to end this. They, you know, they, they, uh, when the, cloaking went down they see they've got a vanguard class cruiser space cruiser and that's where the autobot command is and they go to attack and they are quickly uh, about to overrun the arc while wheeljack is frantically trying to get the arc back online with the energon that they got bumblebee comes back and he realizes that the alphatron protocols are gone from his system but you know now there's no time to worry about that because decepticons are moving in so they hand him a gun and and bumblebee is now he's an autobot he you know he doesn't get the symbol yet but he's fighting with them and you know they're trying to uh keep the decepticons uh from destroying them before they can get the ark in the air so uh they finally get the communication back online and they tell prime. Okay. We're, you know, don't, don't come back to the arc because all the Decepticons are here. You'll bring the all spark right to them. So, uh, prime says, okay, you got to get the arc online. We'll meet you at the space bridge. Um, at the space bridge, uh, I forgot, I forgot to mention all the space bridge pot thread, but yeah, they've been working and they Mirage set up a hologram to make the space bridge look like it was still deactivated to fool all the seeker patrols that were coming by. Uh, but he is basically drained himself of energy. So he shuts down and the hologram is no is uh, deactivated. So Chromie and Sideswipe try to shoot down more of the seekers as they are coming to attack. Uh, but uh, eventually they're over they're overwhelmed as well. So. Uh, Ratchet is frantically trying to get the space bridge activated while uh, being under fire. Impactor is there to protect him, and he uh, he continues to shield him from different blasts, and they're frantically working. So everything is coming to a head. Uh, the Megatron gets the word that the space bridge has been activated, so he, f- he realizes that... Uh, uh, Prime is bringing the Allspark to the space bridge, not to the Ark. So he splits off some of his forces to go converge on the space bridge. He sends Starscream and the Seekers to uh, to go first since they can get there faster. And Starscream is really mad because he was just about to murder more Autobots, but he's he's taken away from uh, his mission there. Uh, and this is just as uh, Prowl and Jetfire are arriving at the Ark to provide some backup support there while Prime and Hound are going straight to the Space Bridge. So we've got all these battles going on. It's really exciting, really action-packed. As Prime gets closer to the Space Bridge, he's intercepted by Megatron and his forces, and they have a little bit of skirmish too. 
So uh, they are um, while they're fighting, then I think Jet uh, Jetfire was was really busy in this episode, and he I think the that he uh, he flew over towards the space bridge and got uh, was able to distract Megatron and uh, let Prime continue on to get closer to the the space bridge. The uh, in the um, uh, in the space bridge, Ratchet is about to flip the switch and turn it on. But just as he's about to, Starscream is uh, has a fires from the air and is about to score a direct hit on Ratchet. But Op- Impactor shields himself, puts himself right in the path of the blast and takes it uh, takes the blast for Ratchet, and he dies in Ratchet's arms, uh, thanking Ratchet for showing him the you know the pathway back to the light. So poor Impactor and Ratchet does flip the switch the space bridge is activated and uh prime gets there he's about to he he climbs up to get closer to the space bridge portal but megatron is right on his heels they have a battle there back at the ark uh wheeljack finally gets the ark going and and uh they uh, bring the ark over to the space bridge and everything is uh everything comes to a head so Megatron gets the upper hand on Optimus Prime and he is about to take this the all spark but uh Bumblebee uh, uh you know f- the arc finally arrives and Bumblebee is there to um you know he he runs some interference he shoots Megatron and and distracts him enough for Optimus Prime to grab the all spark and hurl it into the space bridge and it, it disappears away from Cybertron and of course this enrages Megatron but uh, they, you know, they uh, before Megatron can have his final revenge on Optimus Prime and the Autobots, a giant hand reaches out from the ground and it's Omega Supreme. Omega Supreme has come to aid the Autobots in their darkest hour. And Omega Supreme stops all the Decepticons and and gives the Autobots time to all board the Ark and get ready to leave Cybertron, leave through the space bridge. But Alita One tells Prime she's not going with him. There are still lots of bots still stuck on Cybertron. They have to continue the fight against Megatron. And Prime has the mission. He's got to keep the AllSpark safe away from the planet. So they say their final tearful goodbye. It's a life worth fighting for. And Alita One stays to continue the fight prime and the other autobots get on the arc they close this door they close the bay to the arc and it goes through the space bridge and disappears in a flash of light the next day the uh alita one and other autobots left behind red alert was also left behind they look up in the sky they see a lot of debris so they think was the arc actually destroyed did they or did they make it through the space bridge well Alita One at least thinks that the they, the Ark didn't survive, but they're going to carry on the fight in the memory of all the Autobots who were lost on the Ark, and they're going to continue the fight against Megatron. But they won't do it alone, because Jetfire is still alive, and he dedic- rededicates himself to the Autobot cause with Alita One and the others. And that is where we end War for Cybertron Siege. We have a little stinger uh, out in deep space. The Ark was not destroyed, but it looks like uh, it's been shut down, floating in space. And then Teletran 1's proximity alarm sensors come on and another ship is approaching the Ark. And that is it. So this is a, this is a very satisfying conclusion for me. I, I thought... They wrapped up everything nicely. They set the stage for Earthrise, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we'll talk. We'll speculate a little bit about what's in store for Earthrise. But Jeremy, what what did you think of this conclusion? There was a lot packed into this episode. Yeah, <laughs> and just like hearing you go go through it all, I'm like, for a, a 20 minute episode, a lot happened. I I love the concept of the the zombies being sparkless. And I, I wished when Moonracer was killed, we would have seen like what would happen when they got a new spark. Mm-hmm. Obviously, money. 
the number of Decepticons we saw that was like going for the arc was really crazy. I mean, the whole series we've we've been hearing like it's a war and we've only seen like a handful of Autobots with the number of Decepticons coming against them. They really just kind of the Autobots come across as more of a, a ragtag like insurrection insurrection group rebellion type thing than an army going up against them. But I mean, it's, it still works it. And with the number of other Autobot bases scattered around, I'm sure they, they have more forces. Mm-hmm. Megatron is, I, I love that he's not written as a dumb character. Like in, in G1, there were so many times that he would just do a dumb thing or, or any of the characters would do something dumb. And I didn't really get that with any of the characters in the show. They all, like the decisions they made were for the most part generally well founded and based on the information the character had at the time. Yeah. So that was cool. Will Jack throughout the entire series I really liked him and the voice actor was great. You know, he he they they got Will Jack so well and he's always been one of my favorite characters. So I'm I'm glad he was done as well as he was. Impactor was great. I mean, I love that kind of he had his arc and ended it on self-sacrifice to save Ratchet. That was great. When Prime was scaling the side of the space bridge, it kind of reminded me of a video game, like a platformer. <laughs> uh, and and I, in my note here, I, I wrote that Prime scaling the side of that building will be the most frustrating level of the video game adaptation of the series. <laughs> and also I wrote, this is where pockets would come in handy in regard to the all spark. <laughs> they will be so amazed when they come across a some species that has pockets because they, he was just like kind of holding it the whole time. Bumblebee shooting Megatron. My, my comment was see hot rod. This is how you say prime. <laughs> the best part is, doesn't he, doesn't he say not today Megatron kind of like the line from the movie? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So that, yeah, I mean, all of my notes are kind of like stream of consciousness. Om- Omega Supreme. Since the first time I, I saw the series, I didn't notice him sticking around and watching Optimus leave when he showed up here, it was like a big surprise, but that just even, even the, the battle immediately. And I loved seeing such a, a big character kind of just laying waste to the Septicons. Alita. I mean, I can, I can see why she chose to stay on Cybertron. I mean, for one in G1, she stayed on Cybertron, but in, in my view, she, she was always more on the side of Cybertron on the side of Optimus's crusade. Cause he just, he generally throughout most of this seemed more like on a Holy crusade to get the all spark or do whatever. And he was just so focused, like laser focused on his thing. He didn't see the bigger picture and she always seemed to see that bigger picture and was always questioning him. And I can see that, you know, she knows there are other Autobots out there that were, you know, their bases are now down, they're defenseless. She's going to try to do what she can to to save them. And she's like, you go on your crusade, whatever. You know, it's, it's just, I wish it was spelled out a little bit more because I feel like a lot of people are missing that. But I, I really, really liked our Alita One in all this and how she, you know, hopefully in Earthrise she'll have a much greater character arc and doing in helping save the other Autobots that are left on Cybertron. So th- this was, this was great. I didn't think that the arc was destroyed when it went through the space bridge, just cause I was just thinking in terms of G1, I was like, of course they're going to end up on earth. Well, mm-hmm. you know, but after the fact I found out that the, the scene at the end was supposed to be a stinger after like a post credit stinger. And that we were, we were supposed to believe up until that point that the arc had been destroyed, but Netflix doesn't do post credit stingers. So like uh, FJ messaged me and at, you know, we were talking about it and he, he told me that I, I can see how the characters would have thought. And I immediately went back to the beginning of more than me CI and robots in the skies where the people left on Cybertron thought the lost light had been destroyed. So it, that'll be interesting how they play this. I think that's it for the episode that, my thoughts. All right, Dr. Pants, what did you think? A uh, great way to end the series. Awesome action packed conclusion. I was really, really happy with it. I jotted down some notes too, kind of stream of consciousness, but I'll, 
I'll go through these quick. I loved Optimus jumping for the the all spark and like he does the truck jump, transforms midair, goes for the reaches out for it. I thought that was really really cool, um, especially because you know on screen transformations are fun. Uh, also, I noticed a lot in this episode, but I noticed in my second watch through that if it if any of the characters had a toy that did not come with their own gun, the gun they used was the one that came with the cog figure. So I thought that was just <laughs> kind of fun that that was like the the standard rifle that was used. Astro Train showing up was really cool. Oh yeah, and like it, w- it wasn't just perspective. Was he huge? Like really, really big? Yes. Okay. Yes. I thought that was weird, but then I started to think about it and. It made sense if they, in the future, like maybe in the Earthrise series, if we see them use him as a transport, it would make sense because I'm pretty sure that we've gone away from right. the whole mass shifting thing. But Yeah, it would make sense that he would be huge to fit Cybertron into the side. Yeah, which then makes me, like, makes me a little confused because, like, why wasn't Astro Train like the commander class figure and uh, Jetfire just a leader? Because Jetfire didn't look that big in the series, honestly. Mm-hmm. But... That's 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 nitpicky. It was cool to see Prime finally bring out the axe from his toy and start going to town on me- like melee style. That was fun. The whole episode had a lot of brutal action. When Jeffire shows up and just slices the one Seeker apart a couple of different ways, that was awesome. Prime slices through some guys with his axe. And then the arc's weaponry. Holy crap. That was awesome. <laughs> the laser spinning yeah. around, everything exploding. That was so cool. Omega Supreme showing up was awesome. I put down... Deus Ex Machina, literally. <laughs> but that was really, really cool. That was really crowd-pleasing. And uh, just, I, I already brought it up, but I liked Bumblebee using the line, like, not today, Megatron, kind of emulating Hot Rod and actually, you know, succeeding and not causing Prime to die. That's nice. I'm sad Alita staying on Cybertron. She was one of my favorite characters. And with the next series being Earthrise, I don't know how much we'll actually see of Cybertron, so I don't think we're going to see her in the next series. But... Who knows? Overall, it was good. I really, really liked it. The series coming to an end this way was a lot of fun. The action was really, really cool. And yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what happens. And I hope it happens sooner rather than later. But uh, I wanted to piggyback off Jeremy because he was talking about like Prime and his Holy Crusade. I actually like on my second watch through kind of realized that they kind of had Prime and Megatron doing the same thing where they were both kind of blinded more and more as the show went on to what their original goals were for mm-hmm. the war and like hyper focusing on just doing what they could to win. And it was kind of nice to see them both doing that. So, yeah, but okay, now I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> no, that that's a definitely a good point. Cause I mean, you can hear Alita one being the voice of reason throughout the show. Like, do you really think we should put all our resources on this one thing? And Every you know every decision he makes, uh, she's like, "Oh, this again." <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, on one hand, it is you know, try something different, see if you get a different result. But on the other hand, you are also wagering everything that you have. Yep. So, um, and I, yeah, and 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 she, I mean, and from her perspective, it was all for nothing because they all died. So mm-hmm. you know. I can see why why she'd be, you know, she's very, very focused on saving what what's left. All right. Well, uh, we do have um, I think we're going to we're going to take a little bit of time to speculate on what uh, like what we think will be coming next for Earthrise and maybe even Kingdom. But we also have a little bit of feedback, uh, you know, people talking about the show and just talking about our our review and stuff so uh one came from mike blanchard on facebook uh, he it runs the geek cast radio network and they t- do have a podcast all things transformers hey guys as a fellow podcaster for almost 12 years i have a question for the entire panel do you find it hard to discuss things when you are trying to be spoiler free i used to try to do spoiler free stuff but i found my opinions very limited in having to remain spoiler free. Hence why when this releases on Thursday and I podcast about next week, there will be all kinds of spoilers. Uh, So yeah, I mean, uh, we, we already have, we've gone pretty in depth on our spoiler full reviews uh, on our alt mode show. Uh, We did, we did, we don't typically do spoiler free reviews very often, but this was a special case just because we had the opportunity to see this show early and get a review up 
as soon as, you know, right before the show aired for real. So, mm-hmm. and of course, uh, Netflix and Hasbro had lots of guidelines. Jeremy, Jeremy got a lot of guidelines for what we could and couldn't talk about. Yeah. So that helped us frame it, the discussion a little. Yeah. If, if you want a full list of it, listen to TFU Info's podcast about it. Cause Ant was very creative when he was doing his review. He like, bleeped out everything he wasn't allowed to talk about it was just it was very funny but yeah we we don't normally do spoiler free reviews uh i did find it uh, kind of creatively challenging i think to come up with comments about the show without getting into specific details so i mean on, on one hand i enjoyed the the exercise but I don't know. I've I found like in our comic reviews and stuff, since we we are able to do spoilers in them, it's just it's a matter of not spoiling the whole book that we found. Like early on, you could tell we we would basically do page by page everything that happened. And now, personally, I, I try to hit some of the high notes, but not not you know spoil the whole book. Give you know you still want to be able to read it. And uh, I think, you know, for this for this show, we I think we tried to keep to things we like just saying things we liked and didn't like rather than focusing on individual plot points. So, I mean, there's a lot of, to talk about the animation and the character design that doesn't really spoil what mm-hmm. happens in the show. And you can talk about, hey, these char- characters got a lot of attention. Characters got to have fully realized story arcs. You can say all that without yeah. – getting into the details so and i generally use the trailer as a guideline like if a character showed up in the trailer i I figured that would be fair game to talk about we have some more feedback from facebook christopher barker said omg this is the greatest thing i've ever seen in my life mike blanchard again also just commented that he loved it he had a few nick picks but overall it was awesome tom lynch who's a, a long time listener and supporter of the show says he feels like it was trying way too hard he can't mention specific things because he didn't want to be sp- super spoilery on the, the Facebook comment, which I did reply and mention we do have a spoiler channel in our Discord. So if you want to talk to people about it and you know not worry about spoilers, come to our Discord. We have a channel dedicated to all things spoilers with the show. And I think he did go over there and leave a comment there too. Yeah. So. Uh, number one, Derek said it was it was great. It had an even blend of everything for him: dialogue, action, transformations. That was cool. Christian Brock said overall he was dis- disappointed. If he was honest, the voice acting wasn't good. The CG models were toy accurate and suffered for it. The animation felt like a video game cutscene, and the characters the characters used in the plot felt like they were uh, felt felt like they plugged random characters in to fill a plot spot instead of actually using the characters in a way that was true to their established backgrounds. Uh, he continues um, saying that they only had 20 CG models uh, total, and it seemed like they, they kept recycling the same eight or so to death with random palette swaps. Uh, he's not a G1 purist by any stretch, but it felt like it was done by a team that was looking to get a paycheck rather than a team that cared about the property. The feelings are, are mixed among the fandom, clearly. Some absolutely loved it some didn't like it at all i mean that's kind of what you get with transformers fans but i mean on the whole i think the reactions have been positive i I haven't checked rotten tomatoes in a couple of days but um uh, it it is at an 86 percent audience score which that's pretty good i think i mean we've been starved for really good transformers entertainment for a few years i mean cyberverse is cool but I don't think a lot of diehard fans are really watching it, and R.I.D. 2015 wasn't... I don't know how to describe it. After coming after Prime, that's not what you want. Yeah, but, I mean, this is also more of a mass market thing in terms... in like the, like the movies, someone that is not a hardcore Transformers fan would still go to the movie. Yeah. And I would think they would also see on Netflix, oh, hey, there's a Transformers show on Netflix. I'll watch it. I think it pulled in a lot more of the non-core Transformers fans, and they're also seeming to like it. Um, it, it hit as high as, um, I think the, the last I saw, it hit up to like number five on Netflix's you know top trending shows in the U.S. on the day that I saw it, like um, I think Saturday. 
and Daryl said he saw it in the in Canada that around that same time it was number seven. So it was. I think it did. It's done well on Netflix so far. Yeah, one of the um, when in our interview with Brandon Easton, he mentioned that uh, he thought it was like about eighty five fifteen eighty five percent positive, fifteen percent negative that he saw, but. The fifteen percent negative were skewing a lot in the the hardcore Transformers fans on the fan sites and stuff. So, our demographic, I guess. <laughs> right, but I mean, honestly, if you are familiar with the Transformers fandom, that is probably a lower percentage than I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ever since Beast Wars, Transformers fans have not liked whatever the newest thing is and they have nitpicked it to death and that's just there there is a segment of the fandom that is like that i mean i I try to enjoy everything you know find something good in everything there there are some series i couldn't do that like the unicron trilogy i admit it's not for me other things like the rid 2001 it's bonkers and i love it so i don't know all right uh so I guess now we'll talk about some speculation for Earthrise. And I think, I mean, it's clear they're going to, there's going to be some space adventures. Uh, I'm guessing eventually they'll get to earth, but maybe not right away. Uh, looks like, you know, there's another ship approaching them. So, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, that could be the Decepticons finally found them or maybe an alien ship. Maybe, I mean, in Earthrise, the, yeah, and in, in the Earthrise toys, uh, the Quintessons have become a big uh, a big component of the Earthrise toy line. So I would be happy to see Quintessons being brought into the show in Earthrise. Quintessons, maybe as no, not <laughs> I'm not even I'm not even going to acknowledge that. <laughs> um, and I, I I wonder if we're even. If we get to Earth, are we going to have some human characters? I wonder, like, are we going to have, are we going to see Spike Witwicky and Sparkplug Witwicky? Or I, I just have, I have no, like, the the focus has been completely on the Transformers in this series. So I'm just, yeah. I have, I have no clue how where they're going to go with Earthrise if they're really going to get into the like quote unquote traditional G1 where they crash land on Earth and then. All the Autobots and Decepticons, uh, you know, have a little mini war there before going back to Cybertron. Or are we going to go back and see what's happening with Alita One and Jetfire on Cybertron and and how their fight goes? I'm because I'd, I'd like to see that get picked up uh, and continue their story. But and we've only got six episodes, so I I just don't know. I've got some ideas that. Like these have been percolating over the last few days. So Earthrise, when you look at it and you look at the the term, I have a picture here, originates with NASA from the Apollo missions. And it was like when they were seeing Earth, you know, rise as they were going around the moon. Mm -hmm. I think we're not going to see Earth until the last episode of Earthrise. Hmm. I, I think Earthrise is going to be a combination of space with the Quintessons. Also, following Alita on Cybertron, I think we're going to get both of those. That lets them reuse a lot of models and sets and stuff that they ha- they used for Siege, which saves some money. And then also we get to see lots of new stuff with the Quintessons, and I'm sure we're going to have Sharktacons and stuff like that, which will be fantastic. I think something's going to happen for them when they get to Earth. It will be... I, see, well, we don't know what time this series is set at. So it could either already be in the past or you know, when they crash land on Earth or there's some time shenanigans and they go back in time. But whatever happens, they crash on prehistoric Earth. Kingdom starts and that's Beast Wars type stuff happens with them crashed four million years ago. And I think Kingdom ends with them being like that, that's like the, the four million year gap. When Kingdom ends, it like it's modern day. Hmm. I, I'm probably completely wrong about the ending of Kingdom stuff, but I I just that makes a lot of sense, and, and I'm I'm sure that when FJ hears this, he's gonna message me and laugh at me. <laughs> but I was just thinking, 
why go to Earth right away. That's a whole bunch of CG models and stuff. But in the toy line for Earthrise has so much space related stuff, the Quintus Hans and all that. I think we're going to see some cool space stuff. Do you have some thoughts, Dr. Pants? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always have thoughts. <laughs> Are they relevant? I'm a little confused as to what Earthrise will do because we've been getting, of course, you know, uh, Optimus and we just saw like Prowl and Ironhide. They're getting Earth like modes. So in the toy line. So I would assume that they would show up on Earth. But Jeremy makes a good point that like the Quintessons are there. I originally thought at the, the stinger at the end of the series that unidentified ship, well, it's probably like the Nemesis or it's Astro Train. Right. But if it's an unidentified ship, part of me believes then that it's not a Cybertronian ship because you would assume if Wheeljack got the Ark up and running, they would be able to identify Decepticon ships, especially Astro Train, who's a Cybertronian. So I like the idea about the unidentified ship being the Quintessons. And maybe the beginning of Earthrise starts there before they get to Earth. And Earthrise ends with them getting to Earth. So I kind of agree with that. I think that's a good idea. I just don't know how that works in with the more realistic Earth alt modes, but they'll, they'll figure it out. Maybe they'll just reuse the models. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just ignoring the fact that there are Earth alt modes in the line. <laughs> it's, it's hard for me to ignore it because we've gotten like the Seekers redone and everything. But then again, if Skywarp is actually dead, then why would they make a Skywarp figure? Except it's an easy repaint. Right. So I, don't, I shouldn't go off the toy line entirely. I think you're right that we'll like they'll they'll get to Earth at the end of Earthrise. And I think what's going to happen is, is the all spark landed on Earth. And because it's the source of life, it created Cybertronians, quote unquote, out of modes there and that's where we get the animal modes because maybe it'll be prehistoric earth and that's where we get the beast war stuff they were we have optimus primal and megatron all those created on earth from the all spark and then that's where kingdom goes but i have no idea where it's going to go from there i'm uh yeah i'm not entirely sure there's a there's a lot of thoughts going in a lot of theories i have but i don't know how coherent they are i'm just excited to see more of it and I love the toys that are coming out of this and everything. So really just, just give me more of this, just inject it straight into my veins. All right. Yeah. I agree with you, uh, Dr. Pants about this all spark being the source of, of new beast wars life on earth or maybe yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. That that's, that's definitely a something I think we're going to see in kingdom. So look forward to that. All right. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this review, so <laughs> I think we'll wrap it up here and let's move on to Transformers Media News. All right, so in Media News, we start off with uh, some game info. We have a Transformers VR experience is set to debut in September 2020. Robocom VR is set to download the Transformers reality into your gaming optics. They're going to release an immersive location-based VR simulator in the Middle East in September. And uh, there's a picture of what the rig looks like that you'll be in for that. Uh, I don't know entirely what that is, but they'll release more info as time goes on. We also have the Transformers Battlegrounds video game official packaging art. So uh, we've got the packaging art there for the Battlegrounds game on PC, Xbox One, PS4, and Switch. Featuring the Cyberverse characters, Autobots on one side, Decepticons on the other, with the AllSpark in the middle. That's cool. Uh, And then in cartoons, the Transformers Cyberverse creative team, Throwback Thursday animation panels. Uh, So Randolph Hurd posted a bunch of the uh, animation panels from a bunch of Cyberverse stuff. You see a lot of the characters there, the doodles and whatnot. And there's some cool stuff in that to check out. So head over to that tweet and see the production art on that. Transformers War for Cybertron Siege on Netflix. Uh, F.J. DeSanto shared some concept art. So on Sci-Fi Wire, we've got a bunch of concept art for Cyber War for Cybertron Siege. Uh, a lot of cool locations. There's one of the uh, the rust storms and everything. That's really really cool. So head over to Sci-Fi Wire to check that out. And then more for F.J. DeSanto. Uh, Transformers War for Cybertron Siege. He did an interview part two. That's on Hasbro Pulse. Last week, you guys talked about part one, so part two is up. So if you head to Hasbro Pulse, you can check that out. Uh, spoiler alert for that, but if you're still with us, then you've probably, you're have probably you probably okay with spoilers. And then lastly, on comicbook.com, we have a Transformers War for Cybertron Siege. 
Alita One voice actress Lindsay Russo did an interview talking about her role as Alita One, how she got the part and everything, and uh, talks about the show. And then lastly, episode 19 of Cyberverse dropped on Hasbro's YouTube this Monday. So if you've been watching Cyberverse, go check that out. But only if you're in America, right? Are we the only ones who get it? I believe so, Thanks. yes. Yeah, well, everyone else is watching hockey. So. <laughs> this is true. I mean, which is better, Cyberverse or hockey? I prefer Cyberverse. <laughs> <laughs> but that is it for media news. All right. Oh, uh, one other thing I wanted to uh, just about Earthrise coming up. I'm hoping that Earthrise, we're going to get it like sooner rather than later. Like the fact that we already have the spoiler box, uh, the Netflix toys coming out, Earthrise Netflix toys coming out this fall. I hope that means that the episode, the the, the second chapter of, of War for Cybertron is, is slated for maybe this fall, like October, yeah. November or something like that. Because... Yeah, um, yeah, here's hoping. Yeah, they 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 could. I think they front line the front loaded the production so that they could get everything done. Other Netflix animated shows have have done that where they it's they leave about six months to three to six months between seasons. I was I was gonna say the same thing because I think wasn't it Voltron did like uh, five six episode blocks every six months when they were running seasons. Yeah, but yeah, they they basically like broke a full season into smaller se- seasons. Yeah, I'm hoping they do that with this because I, I, I don't want to wait a year. <laughs> I can only watch these six episodes so many times before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we will finish up the show with convention news. All right, um, TFCon has announced their 2021 U.S. date. It is October 22nd through 24th in Baltimore, Maryland at the Hilton Baltimore Inner Harbor Hotel. So assuming that there is a vaccine and we can actually all be in the same room together, there this will be going on. So I, I am crossing my fingers and looking forward to it because I think that would be a lot of fun. Here's to hoping. And that is all we got this week for Convention News. All right. And that will do it for this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode. Dr. Pants, so why don't you tell everyone where they can find you when you're not on Transmissions? So, when I'm not here, you can find me over on YouTube. My friends and I have a YouTube channel called Nerdstradamus, where we talk about nerdy things, particularly a lot of uh, video gaming. We play games, we talk about that kind of stuff. Uh, We do music videos and fun sketches, so you can check that out. We have a monthly podcast uh, just called Nerdstradamus. If you search for us on podcast services, you can find us there and check us out. Uh, We're everywhere else. There's social media. You can find us as Nerdstradamus everywhere, Uh, except Twitter. We're Nerdstradamus DL. So you can find us there on Twitter. And if you'd like to just follow me on Twitter, I'm Dr. Pants 1412 uh, I'm usually just talking about robot stuff, Transformers, Gundam, anything that has to do with robots. Uh, I like post pictures every now and then. I like to do some robot photography and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, give me a follow there. And, of course, you can find all our stuff on NurseYourDamas.com also. So, yeah, check us out. All right. And uh, last thing we forgot to mention, uh, Jeremy has been uh, moonlighting on another podcast. <laughs> Jeremy, where were you this week? You might be, you might say I was moon base. <laughs> uh-huh. uh-huh. um, I, I was on moon base two this week with um, Mikey and Evangelist from WTF at TFW. We were talking all about the entire siege series. So if you want, more of my thoughts on the series. Uh, check me out there, uh, Moonbase Two. Just find them in all every podcast app, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, nice to, you know, get some other perspectives. They kind of, I don't know, my my brain kind of solidified on some ideas and is opened to other other ideas before this uh, recording. So that was fun. Awesome. All right, we'll check them out. Uh, yeah, I, I, we'll have a link in the show notes. I, I don't know the URL, but, yes, we will. <laughs> but we'll have it. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye. Bye.
Hey everyone, thanks for listening to this episode of Transmissions. But just because this episode is over doesn't mean the Transformers fun has to stop. Join us and other Transformers fans on our Discord chat server by visiting transmissionspodcast.com slash discord. If you would like to learn more about how you could support the Transmissions podcast, just visit transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you again next week. So, Jeremy, what did you think of this uh, this episode? You're on mute, Jeremy. Yeah, I was on. I was muted.